One of the pieces of context that a process carries around with it is an identity in the form of a user ID and a group ID. The process is, if you like, running on behalf of a particular user. If I, logged in as user Chris, run a program, it runs with my identity. Now some identities correspond to actual people, but a quick glance through the password file will show that many exist simply to give an identity for some program or service to run with and against which access control checks can be made. As well as knowing what user a process is running on behalf of, it can also, under certain circumstances, borrow the identity of another account. So we have the concepts of real and effective user identity. Now normally a process inherits its identity from its parent and it stays the same across an exec. However, if the program being exec has the set UID bit turned on, it runs with the effective ID of its owner. Now the set UID bit has the value 4000 octal in the files mode and you can set it with the chmod command as I've shown here. Let me repeat the point. If the program being exec has the set UID bit turned on, it runs with the effective ID of its owner. The point being that access permission checks are made against the effective ID. Just on an historical note, the set user ID mechanism is important because it's at the heart of all privilege escalation in Linux. The original idea came from the late great Dennis Ritchie, who patented it through his employer, Bell Labs. Interestingly, the algorithm was expressed in the patent as a logic diagram rather than as computer code. Ritchie never intended to make money from the patent and it was placed in the public domain. Getting back down to the nitty gritty, a process can discover its real and effective user and group IDs through the four system calls that I've shown here. My emphasis in this section is on user and effective user IDs, but very similar comments could be made about group and effective group IDs as well. A process also has a saved set user ID. This is the initial effective user ID immediately after an exec. And the reason that this is important is that a process can switch its effective user ID between the real ID and the saved set user ID. So it can switch between privileged and unprivileged modes as it executes. Let me talk you through a timeline of how this might look. To begin with, I'm running a shell, maybe I'm just minding my own business, I'm running with a real, effective and saved set user ID of Chris. Then I choose to exec a program that's running set UID to root. Um, the password changing program will be a, a good example of such a program. At this point, my effective user ID switches to be root and my saved set user ID is also set to root. The program may then go ahead and perform some privileged initialization. As an example of that, uh, a web server which needs to bind port 80 will need to begin in a privileged mode because only privileged, that is to say root processors, can bind port numbers less than 1024. That's just a rule in the Unix and the Linux world. So that would be an example of performing privileged initialization. Once that's been done, the process can switch back to its non-privileged identity by calling set EUID. So here we are, we're back with an effective user ID of Chris. The program continues to perform unprivileged work, then potentially it can switch its effective user ID back to being root in order to perform some privileged cleanup operations. 
Now, there is another form of identity called the File System User ID, which is used for testing file access permissions. It's normally the same as the Effective User ID, and its use is sufficiently obscure to make me feel justified in not covering it in a course at this level. Now, when you try to open a file for reading or writing or whatever, the file permissions are checked against the effective user ID. That's the whole point of an effective user ID. But you can also ask the question, would the real user be able to access this file? That's done with the access system call. The mode argument specifies what kind of access you're looking for, reading, writing, executing, and so on. And you will get back a zero if the file is accessible and minus one if not. So, as a demonstration for you, this trivial little program just illustrates the operation of a set UID mechanism. We begin by printing out our real and effective user IDs. We try to open the file ETC hosts for reading and writing. Now, normally, of course, we would save the return value from an open call in a variable. Here, we just want to print it out. Etc. Hosts is uh, readable and writable by root, but it is not writable by a non-root user. Now we do the same thing, but basically here we're asking the question, what could the real user do with this file? If we scroll down, we drop our root privilege to our real user ID, and we perform exactly the same operations a second time. So let's build the program. And we'll try running it. So we'll see that our real and effective user IDs are both 1000. That's the user ID of my account, Chris. The open fails because I don't have write permission on the file. And the access call is giving us the same answer. Uh, dropping our effective user ID back to our real user ID really makes no difference at the moment because they're the same. So obviously we get the same results from the open and the access calls. Now the interesting thing of course is to make this program run set UID to root. Uh, notice that I'm running on an Ubuntu system here so I use sudo to do rooty things rather than using su to get myself a root shell. So first of all, we'll change the ownership of the executable to be root. And then we'll set the set user ID bit. And let's just verify that. And there, notice that the set user ID bit is on on this file and the file is owned by root. So let's run it again. It's more interesting now. My real user ID is still 1000, that's Chris. My effective user ID is zero, that's root. The open now succeeds. Why does it return three? Well, because zero is standard input, one is standard output, and two is standard error, and three is the first available descriptor. The access call is saying, well, as the real user, that is Chris, you would not be able to write to this file. After dropping my effective user ID back to my real user ID, uh, we see that both the open and the access calls would fail. Finally, let's use sudo to become root before we run the program. In this case, I need to specify the full path name to the executable. And you'll see here that now my real and effective user ID are both zero. The open succeeds. It's saying that, well, the real user ID could also open the file Switching back to my real user ID, of course, makes no difference because my real and effective user ID are now both the same. 
Well, not the world's most exciting program, perhaps, but it does illustrate the difference between real and effective user ID.